Good morning, and welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to continue now our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by R.W. Thompson. If you're following along, we'll begin in the first full paragraph on page 545, Vital Protestant History. We're currently speaking about one of the many in a line of succession of biblical and historical antichrists, Pope John the Twenty-Third. We've already discussed some of this uh, disgusting human being, but we're not done yet, or rather the author, R.W. Thompson, isn't done. He says, infamous as John the Twenty-Third was, he was not destitute of ability or cunning. Having reached Constance some time before the emperor, remember the, the Council of Constance was called to settle some disputes among uh, several popes existing at the same time, and uh, John was to be uh, unseated by this council uh, as, a, as a, uh, an anti-pope, which he's now considered in the Roman Catholic Church, so much so that in the late 1950s, uh, uh, a pope took this same papal name, John the Twenty-Third, to simply erase uh, from Roman Catholic history the original John the Twenty-Third. Any, anyway, with that background, we'll continue. Infamous as John the Twenty-Third was, he was not destitute of ability or cunning. Having reached Constance some time before the emperor, he endeavored, he endeavored <laughs> Freudian slip there, he endeavored, he endeavored to shape the policy of the council so as to divert attention from his own crimes. He had already distinguished his pontificate by emptying the vials of his wrath upon the head of King Ladislaus of Naples for no other offense than his having been an ally of Pope Gregory the Twelfth, or rather anti-Pope Gregory the Twelfth, however you see it, which, as we have just been taught by Neothen, uh, Noethen, rather, quoting from St. Antonius, was no offense against the law of the Church. Harmless as this referen uh, harmless as this preference of Ladislaus is now de pretended to have been, yet for it alone he was declared by this infallible pope to be quote a heretic, a schismatic, a man guilty of high treason against the majesty of God unquote. A crusade was proclaimed against him, and those who should take part in it were promised that all their sins should be forgiven upon repentance and confession. His success in bringing the hierarchy to adopt his views in reference to Ladislaus and his promptness in dealing with heresy led him to believe that if he could turn the attention of the council to inquiries of this kind, he might himself escape. Accordingly, quote, the foil he used was the heresy of Huss, we're speaking of John Huss, the early reformer of the Roman Catholic Church. It says, accordingly, the foil he used, the, de the, the decoy that he used, or what he tried to uh, uh, direct the council's attention toward, that is, away from himself, was the heresy of John Huss, which he hoped would give him the opportunity of showing how faithfully he guarded the faith of the Roman Catholic Church, that is, the Pope, rather. Now, to effect his purpose the more certainly, he caused his bull of convocation to be read, wherein, in order to establish the legitimacy of his own pontificate, he claimed that the Council of Constance was but a continuation of that of Pisa, and then announced through one of his cardinals that the council would be expected to direct its attention especially to some prevalent errors of doctrine and, quote, preeminently to those which were originated by John Wycliffe, unquote, knowing that Huss had been accused of maintaining them. Okay, so Huss, 
uh, was following in the spiritual reformation footsteps of John Wycliffe, or Wycliffe, if, if that's how you prefer to pronounce his name, the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe. And John Huss was a, a follower of Wycliffe. And he says he succeeded in part of his plan, that is, in exciting, uh, inciting a persecution of, against John Huss, but not in escaping the doom which he himself richly merited. So the bait and switch didn't work, not entirely. But what came out of it was the execution, the burning at the stake of John Huss. And, and all it was was an attempt to direct the council's attention away from himself and onto somebody else, and to show himself in front of the world as the great defender of the faith of the Roman Catholic Church by pointing out heresy. You see what his demonic mind was trying to do. Now, John Huss, when summoned before the council, was told that he had been charged with disseminating, quote, errors of the gravest kind, unquote, in Bohemia, but they were not specifically stated. He was only notified that they were, quote, manifestly opposed to the Catholic Church, unquote. To this indefinite accusation, he replied, like an, any honest man, quote, If anyone can convince me of my error, I will he unhesitatingly abjure it, unquote. Specific articles of accusation were, however, afterward drawn up against him, by which it was charged, first, number one, that he rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, for those just tuning in, my regular listeners know what this is. But this is the doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church that I call hocus-pocus. This is when the, the priest, standing at the altar in the Mass, consecrates the flat, round uh, piece of bread, the host, just a piece of bread, uh, consecrates it, and says five magic Latin words, and all of a sudden the substance of the bread, this is where we get the word transubstantiation, the substance of the bread changes. And though it remains in all, by all intents and purposes a piece of bread, according to the Roman Catholic Church, it becomes the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ, the whole Christ, nothing lacking, and that it is again to be offered a, as a sacrifice on the Mass. In other words, perpetuating the crucifixion of Christ. And this is why you see so many crucifixes in the Roman Catholic Church. They glory over the, the, the crucifixion of Christ. They think it's a form of worship, but somehow the priest becomes the creator of the creator by, by changing the substance of the bread, or the host as it's called, into Christ to be offered again as a perpetual sacrifice on the, on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, John Huss, after reading his Bible, which was no doubt provided by him uh, to him by John Wycliffe, he realized that this was blasphemy. And that's what he taught. Number one, that John Huss rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation. And by the way, if you're a Roman Catholic, you are bound by Roman Catholic canon law to believe that that piece of bread is Jesus. And if you don't bow down and worship it, you can be excommunicated and eternally damned by the Roman Catholic Church. So this is the weight that this doctrine of transubstantiation carries. In our Protestant churches, we would say it's a salvific issue. Okay? Now, Huss denied this doctrine of transubstantiation. Number two, John Huss violated the Catholic Church with maintaining that a priest in mortal sin cannot administer the sacraments. That is, they can't officiate at the Mass, they can't baptize babies, 
They can't pronounce extreme unction. They can't give marriages. They can't do funerals, last rites. They can't do anything of the ministerial duties of a Roman Catholic Church if they are in mortal sin. Well, now, that includes just about all of the Roman Catholic priesthood. Because if you consider the fact that claiming to be able to create the Creator and to sacrifice Him again upon the altar, <laughs> that's a mortal sin. It's blasphemy. All right? Despite what they teach in the Roman Catholic Church, it's blasphemy, it's idolatry, it's forbidden in the Scriptures, and it's the very basis of the Roman Catholic faith. So every Roman Catholic priest, by arrogating to himself the, the aura of an altar Christos, or in other words, a creator of his creator, has committed an, an abject denial of Jesus Christ. They all live in mortal sin, and none of them are ministers of the gospel. But, but John Huss maintained that any priest who lives in mortal sin cannot administer the sacraments. Look at the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church today. Look at the scandals of pedophilia and homosexuality among the priesthood. And don't be misled. That scourge of sodomy among the Roman Catholic priesthood has been a fixture of the Roman priesthood ever since the beginning of that church. It's nothing new. It's just being publicized today. But it has been a constant curse among the Roman Catholic priesthood, immemorial. They shouldn't even handle the gospel. That's how wicked they are. And John Huss condemned them for living in mortal sin and then pretending to be priests of Jesus Christ. And he was absolutely correct. Number three, that by the church is not to be understood the Pope, the clergy, and the members of the hierarchy. Now, what does he mean by this? He simply means that he comprehends what the church represents in Scripture, the body of believers. And that does not include the Pope, the clergy, and the members of the hierarchy exclusively. Okay? I say it excludes them exclusively. But... <laughs> I'm not just a heretic. I think Rome would probably describe me as an, an obstinate or abject heretic or something. They'd find some special way to classify me, I'm sure. Anyway, John Huss, is, in this one, is tearing at the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope, the clergy, and, the, and of the hierarchy, he says. Now, that's not going to get him... A uh, very good reputation in Rome. And number fourth, that the endowment of the church by secular princes is unwise. Now, what's this one talking about? This is talking about the union of church and state, where the state is the servant of the Roman Catholic Church and does the Roman Catholic Church's will in extirpating and annihilating heretics uh, by, by, the, by uh, execution carrying out the sentences of the church, and also by financially supporting this church. That has always been the role of the state in Roman Catholicism, that the state is the servant of the church and the supporter of the church. John Huss realized that this is not what God ordained, and that this is simply a method of assuring the power, the temporal power of the Pope in the world, and that it was against Christ. All right, number five, that all priests are equal, and it is false that bishops alone have the right to consecrate and ordain. Now, what, what is that tearing at? That is tearing at the very throne of the Pope. He calls himself the Bishop of Bishops, the Supreme Pontiff, and that he is the only one who can ordain bishops. They all have to go to Rome to be ordained, and they all lie prostrate on their faces before his throne. 
to be ordained by the Pope. Every uh, priest who is elevated to bishop looks forward to the day when he can go to Rome, when he'll be summoned to Rome to be ordained by the Pope himself. Now, John Huss said this ordination doesn't belong to the Pope alone. He was absolutely correct. Why? Because he read his Bible. Number six, that the entire church has no power of the keys when the whole clergy is in gross sin, which is basically a repeat of which one was it, number one or number two. Anyway, that the whole clergy is in gross sin cannot be denied, and it is unworthy of any of its claims, especially that of the power of the keys of binding and loosing sins which is blasphemy at the very beginning. Only God can forgive sins. Now, number seven, that he had condemned his excommunication by saying Mass every day on his journey to Constance, to the council. Being excommunicated, he was stripped of his so-called priestly uh responsibilities, and it was a crime for him to continue to commit the, to, to conduct priestly activities. Yet he defied that excommunication. He dissed the Pope by continuing his priestly duties. Now, John Huss was immediately arrested and held in custody as a prisoner to answer this indictment. His place of imprisonment was a nauseous and unhealthy apartment, quote, through which every sort of impurity was discharged into the lake of Constance. When the emperor, who had not yet arrived, heard of this, he sent forward ambassadors to demand the release of Huss, but he was not discharged. On account of his sickness... Occasioned by the foul air he was compelled to breathe in this filthy and poisonous dungeon, he was at last removed to more healthy apartments. This is said to have been done by the Pope, quote, lest Hus should die in prison and the cause of orthodoxy lose the incense of a burning heretic, unquote. How's that for good Christian charity? Hang on a second. Yes, the Pope didn't want to lose the opportunity of drawing in the aroma of the burning flesh of a heretic. John Huss, a man of God, a man of the Scriptures, a reformer in the Roman Catholic Church, one that, that, that did not just leave the Church, but one who stayed in the Church and fought for reforms, Sadly, if John Huss were here today, I'd have to show him all the history that has extended down to our age that proves beyond any shadow of doubt that the Roman Catholic Church cannot be reformed. It is that church which God prophesied would be in this world until Christ destroys it. It's irreformable. And John Huss, as worthy as his struggle was in the Roman Catholic Church, was wasted on the Roman Catholic Church. But what it did was it inspired reformers after him to carry on the work of the gospel and to continue up until this day to expose the heresies and the blasphemies, the crimes and the the abominations of this Roman Catholic Church. It says, his failing health admonished him of the necessity of having an advocate to defend him, and he asked that one might be appointed. But this was refused, and he was told, quote, that according to canon law, no one could be allowed to take part or plead the cause of a man suspected of heresy, unquote, an act of tyranny worthy only of the most heartless despotism. Okay? In, in Roman Catholic jurisprudence, anyone suspected of a her- as being a heretic is, del- is disallowed any representation. Okay? He's basically denied all defense. The only option for a heretic is to renounce his heresy, whatever that is, 
and abjure. That's the only hope for a heretic. The consequences of not admitting guilt and retracting the error and seeking to be amended with the Roman Catholic Church is execution. All right? Now, weak and feeble as he was, however, his defense of himself was a masterly exhibition of his great powers of mind and his un unflinching courage. But it was, no, uh, it was of no avail. All sorts of evidence were admitted against him. Everything he said was tortured into heresy. And after a, a, a mock trial for a few days, he was pronounced by this great ecumenical council to be guilty, not of any crime, but of daring to think. He had ventured to say that immoral priests could not administer the sacraments, and this was considered by a majority of the council as an impeachment of themselves. Why? Because they were, they were guilty of, of base crimes. Every single one of them. R.W. Thompson has made it clear throughout the book that whenever, the, whenever absolute power is obtained, absolute corruption results. And that was always the case with the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. When they were all-powerful... They delved into the most vile corruptions. So when he condemned the immorality of the priests and, and took away their uh, claim to uh, the sacraments, it was considered, they, they considered themselves all guilty. Now, what's the worst thing you can do to uh, a sinner? Is point out his sin. Okay? And that's what John Huss did. And that's why they burned him. They were guilty. And it says he had endeavored to lower the pride and diminish the authority of the Pope and the hierarchy and had thus brought himself under the ban of these corrupt officials. Of course, he was convicted. That had been predetermined. For no victim can be furnished so likely as Huss to satisfy the world of the orthodoxy of the council and the pope. Okay? I mean, if you're going to if you're going to justify yourself, the best thing to do is to take out the biggest, the most popular uh accuser, and that was John Huss. Okay? They didn't just start out with a little a little opposition. They went to John Huss. They brought John Huss before that council. John Huss was followed. He was, he was a, a, a great man of God. Bohemia was, was in revival because of John Huss. In Reformation, crying out against the, the enormities of the popes and the corruption that prevailed under their rule. John Huss was famous among the Bohemian Christians. All who read their Bibles could see that John Huss was correct. He was innocent. He was without spot or blemish. But he condemned the darkness. And he condemned it with the light of the gospel. And Rome didn't want her sins exposed. And to make an example, they chose John Huss to burn him at the stake, to put out that light. But it backfired. It backfired and finally led to the Protestant Reformation. And the teachings of John Huss were spread all over Europe, and a rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church ensued. We'll be back right after this on Inquisition Update. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. 
you will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening the book of revelation says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of jesus christ this is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone, absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update, and we'll continue now with uh, the papacy and the civil power and uh, the history of John Huss and this diabolical pope, Pope John the Twenty-Third, and this council, the Council of Constance, who condemned him and burned him at the stake. He says there was but a single mode of escape for this intrepid champion of free thought. That was to admit the errors charged against him and to retract them. See, you had no no other opportunity under Roman persecution. You just simply had to agree to the charges and repent, do penance. And it says, unconscious of error, he could not in his good conscience admit it, and therefore he had nothing to retract. He appealed to reason and the enlightened judgment of the council, but that body refused him the right to address himself to any motive higher than that which grew out of its own selfish and partisan passions and demanded unconditional submission. It would allow no debate, no inquiry. Every one of its assumptions had to be accepted as infallibly true. Huss, then, when he demanded to be heard in defense of his own opinions, was the representative of the free spirit of the present age, the champion of that intellectual and moral freedom upon which the central column of Protestantism is now resting. How much fairer and nobler a a place does he occupy in history than the infamous popes whose victims he became or any of those members of the council who aided in producing his conviction. Their names are scarcely known except to the readers of history, while his is lisped by almost every schoolboy throughout Christendom. Jerome, now remember, uh, Jerome was a... a uh, also a Bohemian, and he was brought up against uh, charges brought by this council right along with uh, uh, 
Huss, and they were given safe passage. The, pa the papacy agreed to give them safe passage both to and from this council. And Jerome went with him to stand the same fate. And it says, Jerome met the same fate. He and Huss were burned at the stake, martyrs in the cause of truth and freedom. Neither of them exhibited the slightest fear of death. No quivering muscle displayed the cowardice of conscious guilt. They were heroes in the highest sense and left behind them influences which, not which were not long in producing fruits, not expected by their persecutors, but which laid the foundation for some of the grandest results in history. Again, a reference to the Protestant Reformation. And it says, To pretend that the Roman Catholic Church is not guilty of the death of John Huss and Jerome of Prague, as the Papists now do, is worse than idle. The Council of Constance was the highest authority. It represented the entire Roman Catholic Church, and in this capacity tried, convicted, and turned them over to the secular authorities for execution. After their conviction, and before they were removed from the council chamber, paper crowns were placed upon their heads. These were covered with, quote, pictured fiends, unquote, with flames around them to signify that they were, de uh, that they were devoted to death by burning. When this was placed upon the head of Huss, his persecutors exclaimed, quote, We devote thy soul to the devils in hell, unquote, which was more the language of a fiend than that of a Christian. The council knew what the result of the conviction would be. The church at that time shaped the domestic policy of nations insofar as it concerned the church or dealt with heresy. Wherever there was an emperor or king who refused to enact laws against heretics consistent with the decree of the persecution of persecution enacted by the Fourth Lateran Council, he was cursed and excommunicated, and his subjects were released from their allegiance. Okay, remember that was the Council of Con uh, of, of uh, the Fourth Lateran Council, which made it a crime not to persecute heretics. Okay, you, If you failed to conduct the Inquisition as the Pope laid forth, you were also excommunicated from the Church and pronounced a heretic yourself. So failing to respond to punish heretics came with a like punishment. You were burned at the stake. And it says, hence the law under which Huss and Jerome were executed was the result of that obedience which the nations then paid to the church, which the church required of them, and for the failure or refusal to pay, which it visited its uh, severest punishments upon them. Okay, in the New World Order, in the global union of church and state, this is going to take place on a global scale. You know, people call it the Great Tribulation. Well, it's just a continuation of a tribulation that Rome has perpetrated on God's people ever since the founding of that church nearly 2,000 years ago. And the, and, and the, the legal cano, uh, canon law under which this persecution takes place is the Fourth Lateran Council. And it will be commanded of the Pope to extirpate all the nations of the earth of heretics. Okay, If Rome is going to be consistent... If Rome truly is uh, going to control the governments of the world, which I assert she already does, eventually the command will go forth to exterminate the heretics. And who are the heretics? Anyone who disagrees with the Pope. John Huss is our example. He told the truth based on the Scripture, based on his right to criticize both the Pope's and the councils, according to God's holy law. And that's what he did, and he was burned for it. That example is going to be given all over the world in the New World Order. Now, it says the blood thereof, of these, of, of these murdered Christians, 
is still crying out against the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and will not be washed away until they learn to exchange their persecuting intolerance for the mild and forbearing teachings of the gospel. And I'm here to tell my listeners today, that day will never come. The Roman Catholic Church is irreformable. It has no reformation in its sights. It is destined in the world to perform that which it is prophesied to perform. God did not make an error. And we simply must comprehend this and come out of it. And that has, should have special significance and meaning to those in the so-called evangelical churches now that are seeking to ecumenically unite all Christians, including the Roman Catholic Church. That is a repudiation of the gospel. It is a repudiation of prophecy. It's simply blind to the fact, the historical and prophetic fact, that the Roman Catholic Church is altogether described in the Bible as that woman which rides the scarlet-colored beast of Revelation chapter 17. And ecumenically uniting with the Roman Catholic Church is to bring this Roman monster to the foot, to the doorsteps of every household in this country. The last straw, the last straw for the United States of America is the ecumenical movement. God simply won't tolerate this kind of rebellion. Now, soon after the vengeance of the Council of Constance had spent itself in the flames which consumed the bodies of Huss and Jerome, avengers begun to <clears throat> begun to sprung up and uh, spring up in every on every side to proclaim anew the truths uttered by them, and more especially to assert the right to challenge the oppressions and usurpations of imperialism, of popery. The contest became one between reason and authority, between the papacy wielding all the power of the church in maintaining its demand for absolute and uninquiring submission, and in denying to its followers free access to the scriptures and the right of free inquiry into the truths of religion, philosophy, and science. In order ennobly to maintain its authority and thus to perpetuate the existing corruptions, every artifice was employed. Bulls of excommunication and ecclesiastical interdicts employed far more frequently in reference to secular than spiritual affairs were the common resort of the popes, who, forgetting that God still reigned over the world, impiously claimed that they could open and close the gates of heaven and hell at their pleasure and could withdraw the thunder and the lightning from the sky to scathe and blast the opponents of their ignominious and debasing vices. What wonder is there then that these avengers arose within the church when they remembered how much it had done to Christian Christianize and civilize the world, and how much of apostolic purity there was yet retained in its cherished faith. Again, there are decent, good people in the Roman Catholic Church who read their Bible, but they are the exception, not the rule in Roman Catholicism. And it says, they saw clearly that the struggle involved the life of Christianity and the dearest hopes of, Christian, of the Christian world and the inspiriting thought that they were the champions of such a cause gave them a courage and heroism which the world will never cease to admire. The oceans of blood which papal imperialism caused to be shed throughout the beautiful plains and valleys of Europe have not been sufficient to wash from the pages of history the bright record of their virtues and their courage. The flames could consume their bodies, but other flames were enkindled which could not be extinguished, and from out of these flashed forth the light of truth, the gospel. And it says, the Bohemians were very much attached to Huss and Jerome, and their cruel murder produced intense excitement among them. The king of Bohemia, observing one day a nobleman named John Ziska, deeply wrapped in thought, 
inquired of him what he was thinking about. And when he replied, quote, I was thinking on the affront offered to our kingdom by the death of John Huss, unquote. The king replied, quote, It is out of your power or mine to revenge it, but if you know which way to do it, exert yourself, unquote. And he did exert himself in such a way as to bring down terrible revenge upon the heads of the persecutors. With the assistance of Nicholas de, Hus, uh, de Hussinitz, he raised an army of 40,000 men, and a war immediately ensued between the emperor as the representative of papal imperialism and the Bohemians, which lasted for 13 years. Inhuman cruelties were practiced on both sides, and the termination of the struggle was marked by a concession to the Bohemians, which they considered the utmost importance in maintaining their faith and mode of religious worship. This was the allowance. Uh, uh, this, excuse me, was the allowance to their laity of the use of the cup in the sacrament, which the Romanists had denied them because it gave too much importance to the common people. Now, I want to stop for those who are not familiar in the in the in the communion or the mass of the Roman Catholic Church. Only the bread is given to the laity. Okay, the wine is reserved for the priest only, and they being newly familiar with the Scriptures, realized that the cup was given by Christ to all seated and that that cup belonged to the people. Just as the body of Christ belonged to the people, the blood of Christ, which washed away their sins, also belonged to the people. And it was simply an affront by the priest not to allow the people to partake of the blood of Christ. And that's what they wanted, and that's what they got. And it says, The introduction of this concession to the Treaty of Peace was, to some extent, the recognition of the fact that the laity were not a mere canale, and it resulted ultimately in bringing about a union between the Waldenses and the Hussites, and in giving new impetus to the cause of the Moravian Christians. And although the Hussites were banished from Moravia some time afterward, they had 200 congregations in Bohemia and Moravia at the beginning of the 16th century. Martin V was elected Pope by the Council of Constance, and having finally succeeded after much difficulty in getting rid of his rivals, was also anxious to get rid of the council. For like other popes, he desired to govern alone. Here we go again. The struggle between the popes and the councils. Who's infallible? Is the pope alone infallible? Or can a council also claim infallibility and unseat a pope? Okay, the popes always want to rule by themselves and uh, to dispense with councils, except when it's deemed as uh, beneficial to the pope. Okay, if he can call together a council... And with a guarantee of affirmation by the council, then certainly they'll call a council. But if they call a, if they uh, they never think to call a council, if perhaps the council might vote against them. Okay, this is how the the papacy preserves itself. And it says he was afraid to break it up and endeavor to keep in its uh, favor by continuing to execute the Hussites making for that purpose a magnificent auto de fe. So this council, at first as a diversion uh, used by Pope John XXIII, killed John Huss and Jerome. And then to continue uh, with this charade of the council, the succeeding pope continued the persecution of the Hussites. Now, unable to accomplish his wish in this way, he announced his intention of leaving Constance, but was opposed in this by the emperor, who desired to have the relations between them satisfactorily arranged. Martin, dreading the possibility of being cited to a new council in case of disagreement with the emperor, thought to put an end to the proceedings by resort to a pontifical bull, wherein he maintained that, quote, 
A pope was the absolute judge of his own actions in all circumstances and that he could annul the promises he had previously made, unquote. And he adopted this principle in practice. He simply broke his oath. And that is legal, according to Roman Catholic canon law. And I want to emphasize to my listeners once a day, once again, <laughs> once a day if necessary, that Christ fulfilled God's law perfectly. Did he not? Had he not, he could not have been our Savior. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. His grave is empty. God raised him from the dead. But he has an earthly counterfeit. And he demonstrates his antichrist character at every opportunity. And his law grants him the right to violate any oath he makes. Antichrist is not difficult to recognize in the world if we just will. In every way, the papacy is the antithesis of Christ. And it is so obvious to anyone who investigates this that it becomes absurd that there is any doubt in any Christian mind in this, in this affluent, information-rich age that we live. It's inexcusable that anyone who calls himself Christian, who loves Christ, could be in a quandary about who is Antichrist. Now, it says he endeavored to establish the papal rule over the cities of Genoa, Venice, Florence, and Naples, which had freed themselves from the tyranny of the popes. He found the, hand, uh, the husband of Joanna, Queen of Naples, driven out in consequence of his cruelties, and taking advantage of the existing disorders, he offered the crown to Louis of Anjou, on condition of his assisting him to reacquire the papal possessions, thus claiming the divine right to, depo to depose of crowns and kingdoms. Here again he exercises his blasphemous office as king of kings and lord of lords. This is Antichrist. Okay? And Joanna, to defeat this, obtained assistance from Al Alfonso, king of Aragon, and as the Pope's army was upon the eve of being defeated, the wily Pope, the biblical Antichrist, had recourse to the cunning expedient of making another agreement with Alfonso to the effect that if he would dethrone Joanna, he would obtain the renunciation of Louis of Anjou and give the crown to him. Alfonso consented and seized the government of Naples, requiring an oath of allegiance from the inhabitants. Joanna fled, and Alfonso became master of Naples. He called on the Pope for the fulfillment of his promise by deposing Joanna and conferring the title of king upon him. But as the Pope, when he made the promise, had not the slightest idea of complying with it, he replied very deliberately that, quote, he had never intended to fulfill the promise he had made him, unquote that the crown of right belonged to Louis, who had bought the investiture of it from Popes Alexander V and John XXIII, and that besides, he would not aid a prince who had given shelter to a rival pope, as Alfonso had done to Pope Benedict XIII. His solemn promise did not weigh with him the weight of a feather. Alfonso determined to avenge the insult, and Martin V, seeing that he was likely to do it effectually, sent to him a legate to sue for peace. But Alfonso, having learned his, of his perfidy and hypocrisy sufficiently, declined any intercourse with the legate and published an edict forbidding the reception of any of the Pope's bulls in Spain. This was purely a temporal matter. Yet the Pope issued a bull against the king of Aragon, declaring him an enemy of religion, a supporter of schism, and as such deprived him of his dignity and kingdom. Not, it will be observed, for any sin against God or the church, but for daring to rebuke him, an infallible Pope, for his perfidy 
and want of truth. And they call this monster the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. And they bow down and worship him as though he were Christ on earth. And the kings of the earth continue to obey him even to this day. What sense could anyone have that does not recognize the papacy as the fulfillment of the biblical Antichrist? The Pope now gathered an army of Italian, French, German, and English soldiers and sent them into Bohemia under the command of one of his cardinals to exterminate all who embraced the doctrines of John Huss. The Bohemians were not easily overcome and drove the papal troops out of their country. But the Pope, although thus defeated, was gratified that he had succeeded in stirring up a civil war in Germany from which he hoped great gains to the papal cause. Therefore he wrote to his defeated legate, quote, You will immediately recruit new troops to recompense to, to recommence hostilities and to wash out in the blood of the Hussites the opprobrium which, with which your name is covered. Let no consideration arrest you. Spare neither money nor men. Believe that we are acting for religion and that God has no more agreeable holocaust than the blood of his enemies. Strike with the sword, and when your arm cannot reach the guilty, employ poison. Burn all the towns of Bohemia, that fire may purify this accursed land, transform the country into arid steppes, and let the dead bodies of the heretics hang from the trees in greater number than the leaves of the forest. Unquote. Are these the words of a vicar of Christ? Or are they the words of Antichrist? I'll let my listeners decide, and we'll continue with the reading and discussion of this book when we return on the broadcast Monday. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. God bless you. See you Monday. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org.